I'm Jim Bennett, welcome to the Melrose Dems. Uh, how shall we begin? We had a great caucus. Everything with the caucus is now squared away. We're all looking forward to the convention. We have a couple of great speakers here tonight. Candidates, uh, Quentin Palfrey and then Sonia Chandia. So will be joining us in person. Quentin Palfrey, as you'll find out, unfortunately can't be here tonight because of a COVID-related uh, issue that I'm sure he'll talk about it. Good to see you, Mr. Palfrey. Uh, so, thank you. That was a very nice transition, Kelly, because we do have someone here who I'd like to introduce tonight. Uh, a couple of months, about three months ago now, I received a letter from Mayor Broder saying that it was time to get a new Democrat on the Board of Registrars of Voters. And so we put up a call, applications came in, this committee decided to approve a couple of those. One of those was Bridget Alverson. And many of you are familiar with Bridget because she worked for many years in City Hall. I will just say on a personal level, as one of the few people who goes back into the archives of the Melrose uh, Free Press on a regular basis, she was a reporter for the Free Press, oh, 20 years ago now. And this might, this might have been the high point for investigative journalism in all of Melrose history. The articles were extraordinary, well-balanced, in-depth. She kept people in the loop and knowing what was going on, and I can only wish we had that today. But we don't have that today. She's no longer a reporter, but we do have Bridget as our new member of the Board of Registrars of Voters. So Bridget, please come right up. And <laughs> you look lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I am really, really honored to have this position. If there's one thing that's been important to me pretty much since I could do it when I first turned 18, it's been voting. Uh, I strongly believe, I firmly believe, well, okay, look, let me just say this. Anybody who knows me knows I have strong opinions, okay? And one of my opinions is that government should work for everybody. We should have good government that makes us all better people. We should have leaders who bring out the best in us instead of the worst. And right now we're in a bad place in this country, but I feel that really the way forward has a lot to do with elections. It has to do with empowering and enfranchising people. It has to do with having fair and transparent elections that everybody can trust. And there's never been an issue with that in Melrose. Knock on wood. Um, it's true, I was here 20 years ago, when a mayoral election was decided by a single vote, it wasn't my vote, I voted for the other guy. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, it was a fascinating lesson in how elections work, what a provisional ballot is, and how intense people get about it. I spent a lot of time in City Hall that night, and in the days that followed, following the recount, came to understand really how important this is, and to this day, I lecture my kids about it. And anybody who will listen. That one vote made a huge difference. But I learned something else from it too, which is that, you know what, sometimes you're wrong. Because the mayor who did get elected, Rob Dolan, 
hired me. I <laughs> voted for him two years later. So there we go. Um, actually, though, uh, I was living in New York City in the mid '80s, which was a good time to live there. And I remember remember very distinctly what the Democratic primary was like because Jesse Jackson was running and had a credible chance at getting a nomination, and a bunch of ballot boxes came unsealed and disappeared. And it just blew my mind that by breaking a single seal, you can disenfranchise an entire neighborhood full of people. That's really scary, and that was what really led me to start thinking about why elections are important, and not just that you go in and vote, everybody should vote, but all the moving parts. So I've worked with the elections office, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, I've been a poll worker, I've covered them on the news, you name it. The only thing I haven't done is run for office, and now I can't. <laughs> what a shame. Uh, and you know, I have a lot of faith in the integrity of our office. I've seen how well it works. I've seen how hard, my husband's a poll worker, so I have to give a shout out. <laughs> two, two, or George here. Um, and I think that it is really important for all of us to be involved and to stay involved. I certainly would urge all of you who are running for office to consider becoming poll workers because that's something that we always need. And it's a great, there are a few places, somebody said this on Twitter one day, and I really believe it. Like, you go to the polls and everybody's happy that you're there. There aren't too many places you go where everybody's happy that you're there. But, but, plus you get pizza. What can I say? No. Wait a minute, there was no. pizza? No, no. <laughs> Whoops! I, I missed that. <laughs> I'm a poll worker. Clearly, we were not a poll I'm already so decision. <laughs> 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 Damn it, um, I was fortunate to be part of the election in 2020, which I really feel was, was part of being a part of history. That was such an intense election. We had so much to learn. We had to learn it fast. We had to do it right. There wasn't much margin. There was no margin for error. And, and we pulled it off. And so I, I'm stepping into some pretty big shoes here. Um, and I really hope that I will be able to live up to it. I am certainly going to do my best to ensure that Melrose continues to carry on its elections with, with transparency and integrity. So thank you very much for putting your trust in me. I really appreciate it. And we have time maybe for just a couple of quick questions you might have for Bridget. Any questions? All right, well, see you. <laughs> we'll see you, no questions. Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you. Uh, you're going to be fantastic. Uh, find a worthy replacement to Eric Wildman, our outgoing Eric member Wildman. of the Board of Registrars of Voters. Okay. So now we come to the technically challenging but wonderful part of our program. Our next speaker is going to be Quentin Palfrey. And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Palfrey had uh, COVID last week. He got over it, it was all through quarantine. Unfortunately, his wife got COVID. So now uh, he is not able to join us in person, but hold on, let's just unmute him first and let's see how well you can hear. And if not, we may have a technical intervention. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Yeah, doing okay? All right. Well, it's very nice uh, to see you all. Um, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. Uh, my name is Quentin Palfrey. I'm a proud Democrat running for Attorney General. Um, I, I'm a former Assistant Attorney General, and I've seen firsthand how much impact the people's lawyer uh, can have on everybody's lives. During the Trump administration, it was a real relief uh, to have the AG fight back again and again and again against a corrupt and immoral Trump administration. But now more than ever, we need the AG to take on the really big challenges we face here at home. Healthcare, jobs, good schools, a clean environment, racial justice, democracy. We have so much work to do. The pandemic has shown quite clearly how important it is to have a healthcare system that works for everyone. Time for a single payer, Medicare for all type system. I was the first chief of the healthcare division in the AG office at the time that we were implementing Massachusetts Health Reform. We worked really hard to make sure that everyone had access to high quality, affordable health care. I sued some predatory health insurance companies that were taking advantage of Massachusetts residents during that critical time. 
But that's the kind of thing the people's lawyer can do. Most recently, the AG brought lawsuits against Purdue Pharma, the Sackler family, whose lives brought us the opioid crisis that's been so devastating in Melrose and all across the country. The AG can also help build an economy that works for everyone. I had the great honor to serve in the White House under President Barack Obama. I was senior advisor for jobs and competitiveness. On day one of the Biden Harris administration, I came back into the federal government. Uh, we had a team of several hundred lawyers and helped to launch the Build Back Better agenda. We need an AG who will help uh, build an economy that works for everybody, not just big corporations and the ultra rich. We need to fight back against wage theft and Uber and Lyft trying to misclassify workers and take away our benefits. We need a fair share of it that's going to ask the people at the top of the income spectrum to pay a little bit more so that we can invest in transportation and in education. And speaking of education, we need an education system that works for kids all across the Commonwealth. Um, we need to make sure that every child has access to a high quality education. You know, we're almost 70 years after Brown versus Board of Education. Our schools are still separate and unequal. Where you live and the color of your skin should not determine what kind of an education your kids get. And we need you to take on educational injustice as the civil rights crisis than it is. And I strongly disagree with those who think that expanding charter schools is the answer to this problem. That just undermines teachers and siphons away resources, picks winners and losers. We rejected that idea in 2016. What we really need to do is invest in our communities, invest in our schools and early education and child care, make sure that everyone, every child, uh, gets the start in life that they deserve. We need to take on racial injustice in other ways, too. The murder of George Floyd and the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict are just the most recent reminders that there are two justice systems in America. We have heard too many people for too long, we're doing too little, Rick says too much to do with who ends up in the criminal justice system. We need the AG to take on criminal justice reform and corrections reform and police accountability. We need the AG who will finally oversee uh, the state police. The AG can also bring the urgency to fight against the climate crisis. It's going to determine what kind of a life our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and we need the AG who will uh, bring urgency to this fight that's in the Green New Deal. We need to stand up for reproductive rights. Roe versus Wade is under attack in the U.S. Supreme Court and states all over the country. The LGBTQ the rights are under attack in Texas and in Florida and right here in Massachusetts. We need the AG who will stand up for sensible gun control, for affordable housing, and for finally getting meaning. We need to stand up for voting rights. I spent a lot of my career on this issue. I led a team of 4,000 lawyers for the Obama campaign in 2008 in Ohio. I founded a nonprofit organization called the Voter Protection Forum. And our democracy is literally under attack. An armed mob stormed the Capitol to try and disrupt the peaceful transition of power. But with Mitch McConnell and Joe Manchin just in the center of blocking meaningful reforms on the national level, we need to lead right here in Massachusetts. And we're not doing enough. We need the top sensible voting rights reform, like uh, election day registration. We need to make Beacon Hill more transparent and accountable. Uh, and we need to get special interest money out of our politics. There are real policy differences in this campaign for AG, and I want to be clear where I stand. I was proud to win the endorsement of Progressive Mass and the Progressive Dems of Mass. Both of those organizations had straw polls uh, that I won with more than 60% of, uh, of the members because of my policy decisions. Uh, so I believe in single payer health care. I believe in fighting against expansion of charter schools at Wheaton. Uh, the war on drugs has failed. We need to uh, use uh, more sensible measures like safe injection sites. I believe in real police accountability and fair free transit. Uh, and I do think that rent control should be one of the tools in our toolkit as rents get more and more unaffordable across Boston. Those are all policy differences in this campaign. One of the biggest policy differences is about special interest money. We 
So we do have time for question and answers now, and Kelly is monitoring the chat. So if you are online, uh, joining us by Zoom, you can ask questions there. Uh, but first, we'll take a question from the audience. So any question for Mr. Pelfrey tonight? Yes, Anne, here, you can go on a trip. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Pelfrey. I was wondering what you outlined some great things. Okay. Top three. What do you want to focus on on day one and kind of prioritize? Thank you so much. So first, first I'm going to answer your question, but I want to say I think we need a big bold agenda in the AG office because uh, we're at a time when Washington's failing to solve the problems that affect ordinary people. And I think we need the states to step up. Uh, the AGs have had an extraordinary impact over the last few years. The AG office touches on so many different aspects of our lives that we do need it to take on big challenges and have an ambitious agenda. But I want to answer your question. I think the three top priorities, racial injustice, the climate crisis, and the tax on our democracy. As I mentioned, I was uh, in the Biden Harris administration, the senior level in the Commerce Department on day one. And on day one, uh, Biden Harris issued an executive order on racial justice and another one on climate crisis are going to be modeled for what I'm going to ask of our offices across the AG office. So let me take, for example, the climate crisis. The climate crisis is not one thing. But it's something that needs to be a priority across the entire office. We've got an environmental protection division. We brought Massachusetts versus EPA, a Supreme Court case that was a landmark case that assumed Exxon Mobil and uh, took on the Trump administration over and over again. We need to be aggressive in that office. But every office across uh, the AG office needs to take this on. We need to play a role in ushering in a clean energy transition. We need to oversee utilities companies. We need our civil rights division uh, to take on the racial disparities in terms of uh, the impact of the climate crisis. The parts of the AG office that are advising uh, government agencies Depending on the Commonwealth that it sues, need to take the climate crisis seriously. The folks will interface with the legislature, need to use the bully pulpit to push forward an agenda that takes the climate crisis seriously. The same is true with racial justice. Racial justice is not just about criminal justice reform or police reform or, or corrections reform, it's also about disparities within the health care system. It's about disparities within the education system or the voting rights system or the housing system touches on all aspects of our lives. So we need to uh, bring new urgency uh, to these issues. Uh, but we also need to stand up uh, and deal with uh, the issues that affect people every day from a consumer protection standpoint. Right, thank you for that question. And Kelly, do we have any questions online? No. None in the chat, so those of you who are joining us online, please do feel free to type your question into the chat. We'll get to it. Any questions from our audience here for Mr. Palfrey? Jeff. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, rent control. Where do you see the balance between enforcing some kind of rent control and simply building more housing and enabling building more housing? I think everything has to be on the table. I mean, one of the things that we hear all across uh, the state is that uh, rent, uh, rent and mortgage rates are too expensive. Uh, housing is too scarce. And, uh, it's really uh, it's causing huge pain uh, across the commonwealth and across the uh, socioeconomic and racial spectrum, but it particularly hits uh, young people and communities of color and, and people who are less affluent than folks. The uh, AG office uh, has a really deep role uh, in protecting in the area of both lending and renting. It's 
one of the places where the office has shined over the years. Uh, when we were dealing with the Great Recession, a uh, big piece of that had to do with bad practices uh, in the lending and mortgage industry. And we had a huge amount of consumer protection, but also civil rights work uh, that was focused on those bad practices. <coughs> uh, the AG can play a really big role uh, in scaling up renters when they're being mistreated by, uh, by the landlords. Uh, and I do think every option needs to be on the table. At the end of the day, we need to be systematic in, in smart work. We need to build dense housing near public transportation we can invest uh, in transit. Uh, and uh, as you say, we need more housing, but we also need uh, to make housing affordable for everyone. It's a big challenge. It's one of the things that we hear over and over again across the state uh, is one of the biggest burdens on ordinary people. And so I think every uh, Elected official needs to take that issue on. All right. Any further questions for Quentin Palfrey? All right. Well, seeing none, thank you so much for joining us here tonight, Quentin. Uh, it was uh, a delight to have you here. I don't see any further questions. Uh, any any final words for us before you you go? Sonia Chandia is at the second Suffolk district who is running for governor. This is her second time here in Melrose. You may recall she was here in September for our social. And uh, the field has winnowed since then. And of course, as we all know, it's down to two, of which she is one. And it's great to have you here tonight, Senator Chandia. If you can come right up this way. And our setup is very simple. The folks watching at home are right here. So you can just stand in, roughly in front of the screen and they'll get you. And we will hear from you, and then if we have time, we will have questions. So, everyone. <laughs> 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 so, if I'm looking at the people at home, am I looking here? So, you're looking at the people at home, you're just looking towards, okay. yep, towards the screen. I oh, think that's the camera right there. Yep. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's nice to see people in real life, um, as well as uh, on screen. Thank you guys for piping in. Um, and, and I'm going to. Um, do a little correction. Oh, well, this is my second time in Melrose on the campaign trail. I have many happy memories uh, of, of uh, as a kid growing up. Um, one of my mom's best friends uh, lived here in Melrose, and so I have great uh, memories of Thanksgivings and uh, Easter egg hunts on her lawn. This is on High Street, uh, and sometimes we would go put pennies on the. Uh, train tracks that we oh, were trying to go by. Oh, oh, oh. Um, so many fun memories of Melrose. Uh, but for um, for those of you who I might be seeing or, or meeting for the first time, if you weren't at the um, at the picnic uh, back in September, it was. Uh, I'm Sonia Cheng Diaz, and I and I come to this work as a mom, uh, as a former public school teacher. Any teachers in the house? Anyone love a teacher? There you go. All right, I'll hands up. Good. Uh, also, as Massachusetts' first Latina and first Asian American state senator. And I'm running for governor very simply because you look around and it's not difficult to see that every year it is getting harder and harder for families to live here in our state, right? We've got housing prices that are going through the roof. We've got some of the worst traffic congestion uh, in the nation. I was glad that this meeting was a little later in the evening, right, so we could get here a little faster. Uh, we've got the fastest growing student debt load in the nation. Uh, and then, you know, you pile on healthcare costs, uh, childcare costs, and then oh, hanging over all of that, the consequences of climate change are just barreling down on us. And the truth is, 
Leaders on Beacon Hill have been telling you and me and working families all across the state to wait for too long for meaningful change on these problems, for meaningful solutions to these problems at scale. Now, uh, the fire that I bring to this race comes from my past. Uh, I grew up as, uh, you know, always feeling like I was moving between two different worlds as a multiracial child of a single mom. Uh, grew up, that's how she became friends with uh, our, our uh, you know, my sort of a second mom here in uh, Melrose, also a single mom. And, uh, you know, we grew up in a, in a mostly wealthy, mostly white community that uh, my mom was able to move us to kind of by her, finger, her fingernails. And, um, you know, she, my, my dad uh, was a, an immigrant to this country from Costa Rica. He came as a skinny brown kid with 50 bucks in his pocket. But because he had the help along the way of teachers, lunch ladies, and librarians, he made it to college, beating the odds. And he made it to space. And he became NASA's first Latino astronaut. Yeah, right? <laughs> it is an incredible story. Um, and um, one that has a deep imprint on me, personally, and my politics. My mom, similarly big imprint, right? She is a social worker. And a social worker. Anyone love a social worker? And you know, she spent her career helping women and children who struggle on the margins of society, and also building a community for my sister and me here in Massachusetts. And both of these people, both of these incredible parents, taught me about our country's incredible promise and incredible opportunities, but also how you know, the only way that we're going to deliver on those things is to raise our voices together and take action and fight for our best values. And those lessons have stayed with me my entire life. Uh, you know, working as a public school teacher in one of the poorest and least funded school districts, uh, not too, too far from here, the city of Lynn, where every day uh, in Lynn, I came face to face with the way that the gap between have and have not communities uh, and Beacon Hills willful inattention to that gap narrowed the life choices for my kids. And the fire also comes from what I have witnessed over the past 13 years as a state senator fighting like hell for transformational change uh, on Beacon Hill. And I found myself uh, in that time having that familiar experience that I had as a young person of moving between two different worlds on the daily. Uh, but now, as a legislator, it came in the form of going from fancy high-powered boardrooms in the morning to housing development community rooms at night. And in those travels back and forth, what I have seen firsthand is that we just still have too many folks in our government, um, including in our own party, if we're being honest, who are more concerned about holding on to their power rather than doing something with it. And that's why it is getting so hard to live and work and raise a family in our state. I'm ready to change that. Because over the past 13 years, we've also shown that we can win big, right? $1.5 billion with a B in progressive education funding for our kids' schools. And I know a lot of folks here in Melrose were a part of that fight to win the Student Opportunity Act. We've also won uh, criminal justice reform police accountability, LGBTQ rights. So we've shown with these wins that we don't have to just accept the world as it's presented to us. I, I, you know, I've seen it, I don't just say this as an article of faith, right? I know it because I've seen it with my own eyes, that this kind of transformational change is possible in our state. And that's how I know that we can deliver big things like debt-free quality education to every one of our kids in Massachusetts from birth into adulthood. And we can pass a Green New Deal to win the fight against climate change and create tens of thousands of new good-paying jobs, family-sustaining jobs at the same time. And we can solve our housing crisis and close the racial wealth divide in this state. Think about what that would mean for a state to close the racial wealth divide. We can do it. All we need is to stand together, 
We got to see each other's fights as our own across, you know, regional lines, racial, racial and class lines. And you guys, we got to elect a governor who doesn't just say the right words, but who's shown that she'll take on tough fights even when it is not politically convenient in order to win transformational change that we've been waiting on for too damn long. So if that is the kind of uh, future that you want to grab with both hands, and one that is worth rolling up your sleeves and fighting for, uh, I am here to ask for your support, right? Whether it's at convention or this weekend gathering signatures. Um, Sam's right here, he would love to get your signature too. Uh, if you're you know, at home on the computer, you can sign up at soniachangdiaz.com or you can whip out your phones and do it here. Uh, we would love to have you on this uh, growing campaign. Because guys, I'll tell you, and I can say this without hesitation from my time on Beacon Hill, when it comes to winning big transformational change in our state, we are not limited by natural resources in Massachusetts, thank goodness, right? We are not limited by uh, technology or know-how, and we are not even limited by public opinion. Our biggest obstacle is a lack of courage and urgency from our elected leaders. I did not get into this race because I thought it was gonna be easy. Uh, you guys saw me in September when Charlie Baker was still presumably running, right? Uh, I did not get into it because I saw a good career opportunity. I got into it because I have stood on the front lines with families across the state for my whole life. I know the urgency of this moment that we are living in, and I know the future that we absolutely can build together. So I'm asking you to come build it with me, and I'm here to take your tough questions so you can kick the tires and make sure that this is indeed but you want to roll up your sleeves more. So thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. <laughs>
right? Loopholes that allow multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar uh, international corporations to offshore their profits um, rather than paying corporate taxes that they owe here in Massachusetts. We got, that's called the guilty, it's the best acronym ever, so I didn't invent it. It's called the guilty uh, tax loophole, G-I-L-T-I, global intangible something something. Um, anyway, you know, so that's another uh, reform that we need to do, and, and I will keep pushing uh, that conversation because we have to pay for the things we say we believe in as a state, and we need to do it in a way that does not add any more load to low and middle income families in the state. It looks like we do have a question on one. Yes. yes. Um, this is from Betsy Garrett, and I'm actually, I love this question. Um, what are some concrete steps that you will take to close the racial wealth divide? And is canceling or mitigating student debt part of that? I also love this question. And I'm so sorry, I, I forgot my first assignment. I didn't repeat Paul's question to the audience at home. But I hopefully you guys got the gist of it. <laughs> um, so um, let me say off the bat, um, I'm so glad that someone asked this question. Who was the who asked this question? Betsy. Betsy, good question, my sister. Um, because this question needs to be at the center of our conversation in this election cycle, and frankly, every election cycle until we close the other gap. Yeah. Um, I'm the only candidate in this race who has uh, you know, a plan and specific commitments. Uh, it's right there on my website on the issues page. You can find it again at soniachengdiaz.com uh, for how we will address uh, racial equity in this state. And the next, you know, we've done, we've made huge steps with respect to criminal justice reform and policing. Um, and you know, the Student Opportunity Act is gonna help us close a lot of the divides in education, not all of them, but a lot of them. So the racial wealth divide is the next big front um, in our work on racial equity. So this is gonna involve uh, multiple things. The questioner, Betsy, mentioned about um, uh, student debt, right? Uh, I'm, again, the only candidate in this race who is um, committed to and campaigning on debt-free public college in our state. Uh, so we need to keep pushing the federal government to cancel student debt at the federal level for debt that already exists. But going forward, right, we can, in Massachusetts, get to a system where we have debt-free access to public higher education. I'm a proud uh, co-sponsor of the Debt-Free Futures Act in the legislature that gives us a roadmap to do this. Um, and, you know, that's not the only policy, right? I will go back to the early end of education, which is universal early education and care. Um, kids are already arriving at the door to kindergarten with massive disparities um, in their, in their you know, tenderest years worth of education. Um, so that's where the disparities begin. Um, we have to get it right there. We have to tackle the huge nation-leading disparity that we have in Massachusetts in our rates of home ownership across different racial groups. Uh, in Massachusetts, this is you know, higher education and home ownership are the gateways to the middle class. Um, so we have to run at that problem and put in place, you know, targeted intentional programs to increase home ownership uh, and, you know, access to that in communities of color and low-income communities. Um, there's other, you know, very sort of specific tactical things that we can do. Consider that we have two industries that are coming into existence that basically didn't exist uh, before in Massachusetts, you know, in this decade. Uh, one is cannabis and the other is green energy. Um, green energy exists a little bit before, but it is going to mushroom if we play our cards right. Um, huge wealth building opportunities in these two brand new industries. Um, so we have to leverage these industries not just to um, you know, create wealth, but to close the racial wealth divide and make sure that we're being intentional in all of our policies, um, and particularly state procurement where green energy is concerned, to use our procurement leverage um, to uh, prioritize uh, entrepreneurs of color uh, in, uh, in getting those uh, state contracts and those procurements. And in the cannabis space, we actually just passed in the Senate unanimously. Well, it wasn't easy to get to unanimous. It looks easy after you win it, right? But the road there is hard. But a piece of legislation that I've been pushing for years um, to further the, the uh, cause of, of equity and ownership and uh, wealth building in the cannabis industry. Right now, we have about less than 7% of the cannabis license holders for businesses in our state are what's called social equity licenses. Um, this was an intentional program that we set up to make sure that communities that have been incarcerated for years under cannabis prohibition would actually get a foothold and get market share in this new industry. The, the reality is not living up to the law that we established in 2017 to do that, and the reason is lack of access to capital uh, and the high cost of entry into the market. And so we're, with this bill, we're addressing both by bringing down the cost of entry 
uh, by making it easier to clear some of the hurdles, um, and then creating a um, social equity uh, loan fund funded by cannabis tax revenue, right? So it's self it's self financing uh, to give low and no interest uh, loans and forgivable loans to entrepreneurs of color, uh, social equity applicants, uh, because it costs at least a million dollars to just open your doors as a cannabis business. Uh, owner of Massachusetts, and you can't get a traditional bank loan because of federal prohibition. And so, I, like anybody here walking around with a million dollars of liquidity right now, I'm not. Uh, and imagine if you come from a community that has been, you know, over incarcerated and impoverished for for generations because of prohibition. Even less likely you're going to have that kind of cash laying around. Um, so this is just an example of the kind of you know tactical, intentional policy that we need to do to close that racial wealth divide. Questions for the senator, Dave. So, so first, I want to urge people to follow you on Twitter um, and tell you you look pretty well rested because if you try and keep up just with what she's doing watching her on Twitter, you're going to get I can second that. <laughs> so, the secret is the button. You just keep twisting it tighter. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it easier to follow. So my, question, my question, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. We have a newly appointed member of the Nauru Board of Electors. We have at least three um, poll workers in the room. I know. Uh, so what's happened with the expanded in, voting rights, the making it permanent. If I remember right, the House bill didn't have same-day voter registration, the Senate did. Um, is something going to happen soon? Um, do you know what's happening in that space? Great question. So you guys all heard this question in here, but for the uh, viewers at home, the question was, what's going on with voting rights? Are we going to get uh, the voting rights bill uh, that both chambers and the legislature have passed different versions of done? And let's all knock on some wood, find some wood somewhere. Um, it's in conference committee right now. Uh, and uh, you had it right, right? There is the, the biggest, it's not the only difference, but the biggest, uh, you know, kind of tough nut to crack difference between the House and the Senate bill is that in it, both of them include um, making permanent mail in voter registration, um, not registration, mail in uh, ballots um, that were so wildly successful during uh, the height of the pandemic. We want to make that permanent because um, it's, you know, a great way to increase ballot access. Um, so, you know, I think everyone is operating on the assumption that we will get mail-in voting in time for this election. Um, but uh, election day registration is something that I think it's now up to 13 other states do. Um, Governor Baker said he doesn't think it's, you know, a good idea to do in Massachusetts. It's too complicated for Massachusetts voters. You know, I think that if 13 other states can handle it, so can we. Uh, and the sky will not fall. We managed it for two years. What's that? We managed it for two years. Well, so this is same day voter registration, not the permanent. Yeah, we can still do But we can handle it, right? Like, we got more people here in Massachusetts. So we can, what we can do, you know, we, we invented the, um, the, the uh, vaccine, you know, in Massachusetts. Like, we got people here who helped put humanity on the moon. We can handle this. Uh, so, same day voter registration, um, which again is a, uh, you know, also a, a racial equity and economic uh, uh, equity and uh, ballot access issue, right? For making, for just bringing down the barriers. If we want people to participate in election, we've got to act like it um, and make it easier uh, for folks to participate. And then I'll also just give a loving mention here to one of the other differences uh, that was in the Senate bill um, is uh, provisions to make it easier for individuals who are behind bars, but who technically you know, are, still in they, they are still entitled to vote. Um, but that is a right on paper for the most part today, and we need to make that a right in reality. Um, if you're serving a misdemeanor sentence, or there are thousands of people who are behind bars and haven't been convicted of a damn thing because they're sitting there pre-trial, very hard to get your ballot uh, behind bars. Um, so there's provisions that we can uh, also further there, not just to protect voting rights, but to advance them. Okay. Uh, Kelly, do we have any further questions online? We do not. Okay, so I think we have maybe time for one more question from the audience. Maybe two. I'll try. Why don't we give me both questions? I'll try and just speak around. Uh, as a former teacher. Uh, how would you propose that we try to bring equity to education across all uh, all peoples? And it seems like such a disparity between the Boston system and the Melrose system, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, what right. would you do? All right, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit to answer that question, but I want to keep my promise that I'll try and do speed round here. Freeze your part. We need to go freeze your part. OK, easy, two light questions. Um, so uh, for the folks at home, the questions were, what can we do to close educational disparities in our state? Um, and what am I going to do about prison reform? Get it right? OK, let me try and take them in that order. 
uh, speed round version. If you want to see the full detailed plan for our Educate for Education, my platform, it's on the website. It was our okay. first plan that we released because this is the bedrock, I think, of how we tackle so many other problems in our state. Okay. Um, but the speed round version is we need to implement with fidelity and on schedule the Student Opportunity Act, which so many of us work so hard to get passed. I wish I could say it would happen just because we got it into law. You'd think that it would work that way. Um, but this governor has not been willing to adhere to the law that he signed uh, you know, himself in a ceremony with great fanfare. Um, we've had a watchdog for the past couple years. Under my administration, I have made an ironclad promise that we will implement it on schedule. I will veto any budget that does not. Um, and you know, we've got to follow through on the promises that we made there. That's going to go a long way um, to closing disparities in funding in, you know, between school districts. Um, and already is going to be a game changer for many districts like Springfield and Poland and Long School. Uh, I will re-up on universal uh, early education and care, universal affordable early education and care, so that we're not starting kids in kindergarten with those huge disparities to begin with, and then debt-free public college, so that we're going the distance. Um, on prison reform, oh, there's so many things to do. Um, one supporter of uh, a moratorium on new prison construction, right? This is, uh, if you build it, they'll come. <laughs> Um, let's don't let you know, first thing when you're in a hole is stop digging, right? Um, and this is a great victory that we should all feel a share in in Massachusetts, that we're about to close a prison in Massachusetts, right? The administration just announced that they're going to close one. Yeah. We've seen a de steady decline in jail and prison populations, thanks in large part to the 2018 criminal justice reform bill uh, that I and others, probably some of you, helped push for. Um, but, you know, you know, even as the jail and prison population has been going down, I'll give you guys one guess which way the spending line has been going up. I just gave you a little hint. It's not down. Yeah. Uh, right? So this is a huge piece of prison reform. It's being intentional about pulling the money out uh, so that we are right-sizing our carceral system. And we are intentionally, you know, and, and with discipline and transparency, taking that money, at least half of those savings, I've got a bill to do this, and putting them right into a trust fund that is dedicated for reinvestment in community over-incarcerated, over-police communities. And the people at the table for that trust fund with the decision-making authority over those grants have to be from the communities that it is meant to serve. Um, so nothing about us without us. I, there's a ton of other things. We need, a, we need a clean house at the DOC, change leadership, you know, put in people, place people who are truly committed to the rehabilitative mission um, and measuring success by you know, how the 90 to 95% of people who are in prisons who are returning to communities uh, in, in Massachusetts, how successfully they return and reintegrate into communities. The voting rights things that I mentioned before. Um, so that's just a scratch on the surface there, but I think it gives you a sense of my, my values and my intensity on this issue. Oh, that would sort of speed around. No, no, thank you. We definitely got a sense of both your values and your intensity. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. It's very much said.
Every day, you hear about scammers, hackers, and thieves trying to use the internet to steal your money and your financial information. The fact is, you, me, we can foil many of their attempts. Every day, we do things to make it tough for bad guys to break into our homes and our cars. We can make it tougher for them to break into our computers, too. Here are some ways to foil a hacker and protect your financial information. Install security software on your computer. Well-known companies offer plenty of free options. Set the software to update automatically so it can deal with any new security threats. While you're at it, set your operating system and web browser to update automatically too. If you're not sure how, use the help function and search for automatic updates. If you get a phone call, an email, a text, or a pop-up that says your computer has a virus or malware, don't buy the story or the security software they're selling. It could be a trick to get you to buy software that's worthless or even harmful. Treat your financial information like cash. It's a hot commodity. If someone asks for your financial information, say your social security, credit card, or bank account number, Ask why they need it and how they're going to protect it. If you think you've found a good deal online, but you aren't familiar with the company, dig a little deeper. A quick internet search with the name of the company and the word review or complaint can reveal a lot. Always look for a physical address and phone number too. That way you know who to contact if there's a problem. Don't provide your personal or financial information unless the website you're on is secure. If the URL doesn't start with HTTPS, don't enter your financial information. That S stands for secure. It means the information you're sending is encrypted and protected. Make your passwords count. They should be at least 10 characters and a mix of numbers, letters, and special characters. Don't use your name, birth date, or common words. Don't use the same password for several accounts, as tempting as that may be. If it's stolen, hackers can use it to access your other accounts. Keep your passwords in a secure place and don't share them with anyone. Back up your computer files. For example, copy important files to an external hard drive on a regular basis. That way, if there's a problem with your computer, you won't lose everything. Life is online. Whether you live it using a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, or a desktop, it's a good time to make computer security a habit. Find out more at OnGuardOnline.gov, the federal government site to help you be safe, secure, and responsible online. You can't turn your computer on or off. It's acting up, running slow, opening pages you didn't click, displaying pop-ups constantly. There's a good chance your computer's been hacked or infected with a virus and needs your help. Stop shopping, banking, and entering passwords online until your computer is cleaned and restored. It's inconvenient to be sure, but it's a necessary step to prevent the situation going from bad to worse, from hack to horrible. Update your security software. Install a new version from a reputable company. You can use your phone or another computer to check reviews of security software. Tech blogs and retail sites usually post them. Choose carefully. Scammers sometimes advertise security software that's malware in disguise. Make your decision. Get back online and download the software. If the security software finds malware, it flags it for you. 
Delete the suspicious files and restart your computer. If you're still having problems, contact your computer manufacturer or other tech support and find out what else you can do. Once your computer is back to normal, change the passwords you've been using for your bank accounts, your email accounts, and all your other important accounts. The safest route is to choose and use passwords that have upper and lowercase letters, as well as numbers and symbols. And finally, make sure your operating system and internet browser are set to update automatically. You want to keep your computer operating at peak performance. Visit OnGuardOnline.gov to learn more. Scam artists are pretending to be IRS officials to get your money. They'll call, email, or text you, claiming you owe back taxes or there's a problem with your tax return. They even rig caller ID to make the call look official. They play on your fears. They threaten to take your driver's license or sue, arrest, or deport you. They want you to pay fast. What's the truth? The truth is the IRS's first contact with you will always be a letter in the mail. It's not a phone call, email, or text message. They won't insist that you pay with a prepaid debit card, a wire transfer, or cashier's check. Now you know. Has an IRS imposter contacted you? Report it at ftc.gov slash imposters. If you have a telephone, robocalls may be ruining your day. I'm Katie Daffin, an attorney at the Federal Trade Commission. If you answer the phone and hear a recorded message instead of a live person, it's a robocall. If the recording is a sales message and you haven't given your written permission to get calls from the company on the other end, the call is illegal, period. So when you get an illegal robocall, here's what to do. Hang up the phone. Don't press one to speak to a live operator and don't press any other number to get off the list. If you respond by pressing any number, it will probably just lead to more robocalls. You might consider contacting your phone provider and asking them to block the number and whether they charge for that service. Remember that telemarketers change caller ID information easily and often, so it might not be worth paying a fee to block a number that will change. Finally, contact the FTC to report your experience. You can do that online at ftc.gov or by calling 1-877-FTC-HELP. To learn more about illegal robocalls and what the FTC is doing to stop them, visit ftc.gov slash robocalls. That's ftc.gov slash robocalls. I dare you. I dare you to change the world. Yeah, you. Getting that college education. I dare you to be somebody important. Like be a teacher. Or a reality TV star. I dare you to stand up here. To call the shots. To be a role model. An inspiration. An innovator. To be a teacher. Think you can change my life? Make me excited about science like you? Have a career that really means something? Then do it. I dare you. If you love them enough to relearn math so you can teach them math, then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're correctly buckled in the back seat.